Well, thank you very much, Martin, for inviting me and inviting Brian, who passed it on to me. And thank you to Jefferson Unitarian for having me. And thank you for all of you. Uh, I'm excited to give you a, a little bit of an overview about a big idea that we've been developing within the National Lab System for the last year, about a year and a half type time frame. And that's what we call hydrogen at scale, or H2 at scale. And the real thought behind this is, what's the real role of hydrogen in a future heavily decarbonized energy system? What are the opportunity spaces and what R&D should be done? And as you can see by the number of labs down here on the bottom of this slide, it's not just NREL who's working on this. This is a multi-lab uh, operation, a multi-lab initiative that all of us are involved in in different ways. So that ranges from those of us in the applied research labs like NREL and the Idaho National Lab, uh, down to basic science labs, even some of the weapons labs in places where I don't really know what they do, like the Stanford Linear Accelerator Lab, uh, are all involved in this type of project. So the real question, the question that Martin asked me to, to, to try to answer tonight is, can hydrogen save the energy system? And first of all, we got to think about, well, what is the energy system? But even before that, I've got the slide I never put in a presentation. My attribution and disclaimer, um, obviously this work was supported by the Department of Energy or by the national laboratories in using DOE funding, ultimately. Um, and the views expressed in this presentation are those of mine, not the, and they do not necessarily reflect those of NREL or the U.S. Department of Energy or any of its offices. That's there just in case somebody's reporting back to DC on me. Um, so the energy system, the energy system as we know it today, obviously is made up of kind of three major pieces as we think about it. Transportation to get us from place A to place B or back, or to get goods to us that we need. The industrial sector, which is used to be able to produce goods or be able to produce materials that we need for many purposes, all the way from our food to the chairs that we're sitting in, to the podium in front of me, and then electricity, which we use across at least the industrial sector, a little bit in the transportation sector, if you've got one of those $12,000 Nissan Leafs, or uh, we use for our building uh, heating and cooling in many cases. And the energy sector is obviously very, very large. And it's got a lot of things going on in it. Some of the, I like to start out, I'm an engineer by training, which I don't think I put in that, in my little bio, but I'm an engineer by training. So I think about numbers first. I like to start out with numbers and think about, well, what do those numbers mean? And you can see up here, the US uses about 3,700 terawatt hours of electricity per year and about 7.2 billion barrels of, of oil annually, which is a lot. And we know it's a lot because we know that each one of us uses quite a bit. But let's put that into a little bit of context. There's a, over 6 million Americans who work directly in the energy sector. That's 4% of the workforce. One out of every 25 people you meet is somehow working for the energy sector. Whether those are, whether those are people on rigs or in refineries or running pilot plants or installing solar panels on your roof or whatever they might be. One out of every 25 workers is working in the energy sector. Air pollution, and that's obviously a huge deal, but on the other side, in terms of pollution and challenges, air pollution causes about 200,000 premature deaths annually in the US. Well, that sounds like an interesting number. Let's put that in context. The opioid epidemic, which we hear about, at least I hear about in the news every single day, causes about 50,000 deaths per year in the US today. Air pollution causes four times as many deaths in the US. And that's a very clean country. If you've been to China, you can just imagine how many deaths air pollution causes. And that's just on direct pollutants, socks, knocks, particulates, things like that. Doesn't get into the secondhand deaths of greenhouse gases and, and global climate change because of those. The US oil, the US oil industry imports about $100 billion uh, worth of oil in the US today. Again, that sounds like uh, an interesting number. It's about half a percent of our GDP, which is interesting. But one of the things that Trump ran on this last fall was that we've got to reduce our imports. We've got to be more self-sufficient as a whole. 20% of our total imports by dollars, or 20% of our trade deficit by dollars, not our imports, but our, no, our net trade deficit by dollars is for oil imports. So oil is a huge deal still, even though over the last, you know, my career, I think about it 20 years ago, we never thought that we would be able to produce enough, enough oil to be over 50% of our uses in the US today. And we're now at about, we're down at almost 60% of our total oil is domestically produced, and about 40% is imported today. So everything has changed quite a bit, 
But we're still questioning, how do we pro provide the services that we need? Transporting, moving things back and forth, the materials that we use, and the electricity we use to cool and to heat our buildings in the most beneficial manner. One of the ways that we've been thinking about, and I'm sure that this group has thought a lot about, is, well, let's electrify, let's electrify everything, which is a, a great concept. And in many ways, we've started to try to do that. This figure here shows on the y-axis the amount of variable renewable electricity that could be, that is being used in these actual operating systems. And on the x-axis is the system size. And note that that's, that's a kind of an exponential or a logarithmic type scale up there. So we've been pretty good at places like Alaskan villages where it's really remote and it's really expensive to import the oil that's necessary to be able to run, uh, to be able to run the, uh, be able to, to be able to provide the energy required to that village or the electricity required to that village. We can get up to about 80% and have done that. Likewise, an island like Maui, which has many of the same problems, but is, as you can see here, about 15 times larger, you start to get to about 35% variable renewable energy running it. Here in the continental United States, where we're very large, oh, I guess I don't have a, a pointer here. Here in the continental United States, where we're very large, we're only at about 5% wind and PV type electricity. There's some places in between, like Denmark, Germany, California, that have hit kind of intermediate points that are pretty large systems, large enough to really think about, but in many ways they cheat a little bit in that places like Denmark, when their wind is blowing and they're producing more power than they need, they send the extra electricity over to Norway. It's used in pump hydro, pumps the water uphill, and then when Denmark needs more energy, that water flows back down, they produce electricity, and they send it back across to, to, to Denmark. Likewise, Germany uh, Germany's connected throughout, the, throughout Europe, and California's connected to the western part of the grid. So they've got opportunities to be able to make this happen, but they've got the opportunities to be able to share it. Well, the real question is, can we get to these very high percents, 80, 90, 95, maybe even 100% that we need in the US today, uh, without, without being able to share, being on a, a locked continent. My colleagues at NREL have done quite a bit, of, quite a number of studies around this. So you can see Lanai up there as an island looking to get it to 50%. The Western Wind and Solar Integration Study, which looked at the Western interconnect in the US. So it's essentially the Western half of the United States, west of the Mississippi, excluding Texas. And at the, using the Urgis Study, or the Eastern Renewable Grid Integration Study, uh, my colleagues looked at about 30% penetration of renewables. Note that we're missing ERCOT, uh, which is Texas, which is a, na a nation unto itself in many ways in the electricity markets. Uh, we are still doing that study. We're still only doing work in that space. So we've looked at, well, can we get to 30%? And we see ways to get to 30%. We even see ways for places like California that are connected to the rest of the grid to be able to get to 50%. And our Renewable Electricity Futures Study, which I bet you had a speaker on about four or five years ago here, found ways to get to 80% renewables, which is about 45% wind and solar. They use biopower to kind of balance the grid and be able to make the grid work there. So we thought about how do we really get to these points? How do we make this work? And we thought about how do we get even close to where the DOE goals are of about 54%. So the wind program within DOE has a goal of 35% of the nation's energy needs in 2050 being wind, and the solar program has a goal of about 19% of the nation's energy needs in 2050 being PV. So that's about 54% total, and we've thought about how do we start to get there. And we've really identified some good methods to get us to 25% or so, and we've found that there's some harder methods to get to 54%. However, if we're really going to deal with climate change, we really need to be 80% or higher for, for electricity. And that looks like it's going to be really, really difficult to get there. There's some people who have thought about some ideas, but the actual grid balancing, the grid challenges, sounds, sounds very, very problematic to get there. So what do we do with this problem? Well, President Eisenhower once said, if you can't solve a problem, enlarge it. And so, how do we enlarge this electrical grid problem? Well, the first thing that we looked at is, well, what else is going on in the energy sector as a whole? Uh, some of you may be familiar with these Sankey diagrams that, were developed out of, that are developed out of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory every year. Uh, they develop the diagrams that show kind of how we use energy. So you can see our energy sources here on the left side, what our key four sectors are that we use it here near the right. You can see how much is actually used to, to be able to provide services that we need and how much of it is lost. 
really regard, uh, really because of the first and second laws of thermodynamics, we only get electricity generation about 30% efficient today using today's technologies. Um, anytime you run your air conditioner or drive your vehicle, you've got inefficiencies, heat generated, things like that that don't provide services. So we can see here that even though that electric grid is, mo is very, very important and it's usually the first place most of us in the energy world go to be able to solve the problems, it's only about 40% of our total energy use within the US. The remaining 60% is direct use of natural gas for heating and petroleum for transportation pr primarily, a little bit of petroleum for industrial uses for combustion and for producing chemicals. Um, one of the things that most people don't recognize as they look at a diagram like this, and one that doesn't show up in the normal Lawrence livermore sankey diagrams, if you've looked at these before, is the fact that about 2% of our total energy use in the United States today goes to make hydrogen. Where do we use that hydrogen? Well, about half of that is used for oil refining. As we get heavier and heavier crudes, we require more and more hydrogen to remove sulfur, to shorten the crude length so that the, the, the fuel can actually flow. We can get it into our, into our gas tanks, use it in our gas tanks as gasoline and as diesel, uh, and, and those types of products. The other half of it primarily goes to ammonia. What do we use ammonia for? Well, it's used to be able to produce urea and other chemicals that we use for fertilizer today to be able to provide food for us and for much of the world in many cases today. So we use a lot of hydrogen today, and we recognize that electricity is only 40% of our total energy use. So if we take Eisenhower's advice, we enlarge the problem, why don't we look at some of the other opportunities that are out there? And that really is what led us to this H2 at scale concept. Just for completeness sake, I threw in a slide here that shows carbon emissions, and you can see that again, about 40% of our total carbon emissions are from the electric sector. So it'll become important as we talk about some of the later slides. So what is this H2 at scale concept, and why do we think it might be so interesting? Well, we've got this grid that we all know is evolving today, and it's got some nuclear, it's got some coal, it's got some natural gas on it, it's got wind, it's got PV, if you want to be able to balance the grid so that you can use power when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing like right now, there's lots of people that have proposed energy storage technologies such as batteries or compressed air energy storage or other types of energy storage for that purpose, which is great. And batteries have a great round trip efficiency. However, you start running into seasonal problems as well. It's not just that the sun, the sun shines day and night pretty normally, but those of us that live here in Colorado know here, at least, the wind blows in January, or at least at my house, it blew on Christmas Day this year and blew some shingles off the roof. Blows that kind of winter-type time frame, but it doesn't blow nearly as much in, say, September, October, November. So if you're depending upon wind to produce a lot of your energy, you need to store that energy for six months before you're actually going to use it. So batteries are a challenge to be able to do that, and so hydrogen has been considered as an opportunity to be able to do that using electrolyzers and electrolysis to be able to produce hydrogen, and then you store that hydrogen in underground caverns where the energy density is much higher than, say, compressed, compressed air energy storage, and then in September or October, you could reproduce power with it. However, the round-trip efficiency of that is pretty bad. It's only, say, 40% or so. It's about 60% for hydrogen generation, about 65 or 70% for converting that hydrogen back to electricity. You've got a total round-trip of efficiency of only about 40% doesn't seem like the most valuable way to use it when you can use what we call one-way storage, which is taking that hydrogen and using it for all kinds of other uses. As I noted a couple slides ago, we use hydrogen today for a lot of uses in terms of fuel production for oil, with, with oil. Um, you can use it as we used uh, over the last, or we've talked about over the last 10 years for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, which can be very efficient and can be filled up very, very rapidly. It's kind of the same time frame. As a, as a gasoline uh, vehicle today. It can be used to produce synthetic fuels. If you just have carbon dioxide, uh, Brian Pivovar, who leads this effort, the, this multi-lab effort, my colleague at NREL is a, is a chemical, PhD chemical engineer by training. And uh, he is a catalyst guy. And so he says, if you give me hydrogen, you give me carbon dioxide, I can make you any organic chemical you'd ever want. And that's pretty much true. So if we wanted to, we could really try to get there with synthetic fuels straight from carbon dioxide. My colleagues in the biomass area are now looking at making biomass and biofuels. And a lot of you have probably heard about cellulosic ethanol, which was kind of the, the thing that we were doing R&D on previously and is now starting to be commercialized when the gas prices start to go up uh, across the US. 
But now they're really looking at, well, let's make that more efficient. And the problem with biomass is you've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen within, within the biomass itself. But in a fuel, you really only want carbon and hydrogen in it. And so you've got to get rid of that oxygen somehow to be able to make a fuel that runs like our gasoline, our diesel, our jet fuel, and our, our marine fuels today. What's the easiest way to get rid of it? Well, you add some hydrogen, you use a catalyst, and you can take that oxygen out, and you end up with fuels that can be run in our vehicles today or our airplanes today. So that's really a direction they're headed in being able to look at this opportunity for very long-term 100% renewable type situation. You want to use biomass for jet and marine because there's, you need a liquid fuel there, but how do you get rid of the oxygen? You use hydrogen to get rid of it. So that's another opportunity we have for hydrogen. Likewise, there's a lot of industrial opportunities for hydrogen. There's ammonia, which I mentioned for, for, uh, for, um, for fertilizers today. And if we use more biomass for biofuels, we'll need more ammonia in the future. There's metals refining. There's technologies that are being developed uh, out of the University of Utah and other places that are looking at how do you make steel or the pig iron for steel without using coke, which is one of the big drivers for pollution. If you remember the pictures of pollution of Pittsburgh uh, about 80, 90, 100 years ago, or you look at pictures of Beijing today, most of that pollution that you see that causes the awful, the awful uh, lack of visibility is not caused by power plants. It's caused by, few, uh, caused by metals production in both of those cases, and the coke and the coal that's used for that and the particulates that come off of that. So we're looking at hydrogen for that. And in my mind, if you've got cheap, clean hydrogen, there's a ton of p other potential end uses, both organic and inorganic uses for that, that have yet to be developed, and we have yet to have great opportunities to use. So this is the H2 at scale concept as a whole. It's use electricity to be able to produce hydrogen to be able to get to all of these. But there's a second key aspect to that. As we all know, when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining, or when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, there's only a certain load when that's happening. So we only need a certain number of megawatts to be able to run the Denver metro area, even at noon on a very hot day like today was, to be able to run all of our air conditioners. Why would you want to add any solar panels beyond that point? Well, when there's no value for them, because you would just be curtailing that electricity or you have to put it through a very expensive storage step. Well, one of the things we can do is if we add hydrogen electrolyzers, we could take that electricity that is not necessarily used at that point in time and be able to produce it for hydrogen for all these purposes that I've shown up here. And if you were to do that, and if we were to pay a little bit for that electricity, let's say half a cent a kilowatt hour or a cent a kilowatt hour, that would be enough of an economic driver, we believe, and I can't show the results today because we haven't finalized them yet, but we believe that would be enough of an economic driver that you would then actually build some more solar cells that 75% of the time they'd sell into the grid, 25% of the time they'd produce hydrogen, but the economics would then work out, whereas if they were to sell into the grid 75% of the time and curtail the other 25%, they wouldn't be economically viable and you wouldn't use them. So we're doing work in that space as well to be able to show how this idea can not, not only does it help the end uses by having hydrogen, but it can help the grid become cleaner and cleaner in a very cost effective way. So the vision, as you can see here, and this is a, a, a very wordy slide, I apologize for that. But the vision, as you can see here, is to really generate, to really produce hydrogen and use it as an intermediate that both increases the variable renewable power on the grid, which is what I just spoke about, and is used as an intermediate that can then be utilized downstream for all kinds of other purposes. In addition, thermal power generators like nuclear plants that are running at base load today and are really afraid of what happens when they are only able to sell 80% of their energy because the other 20% of the time there's enough wind or solar energy on, on the system, they can be benefited in that they can sell that energy to be able to produce hydrogen as well. We've got the same problem with geothermal and with concentrated solar power if it doesn't have a lot of so storage. In addition, there's opportunities for using, uh, using natural gas in a more, in a more carbon efficient way in that you can convert that natural gas to hydrogen using steam methane reforming, capture the CO2, sequester it, and then utilize the hydrogen in, in all the places where we need it because you aren't going to be sequestering, say, from the furnace in your house, which leads to all kinds of benefits. Energy sector jobs, manufacturing competitiveness here in the U.S., especially with the low energy costs, the great resource we have here today, 
uh, enhance energy security, which is very important to, the, to most Republican administrations, enhance national security, again, very important to Republican administrations, improved uh, air and water quality due to reduced emissions, and uh, decrease energy system water requirements because we'd be using more wind and PV, which have a much, much lower water requirement than, say, a natural gas electricity generator or a coal generator or a nuclear generator. So that's the vision as a whole, just kind of laid out there. Whenever I say this vision, whenever I speak to anybody about this vision, oh, I forgot the last line, getting all these benefits in a single energy system significantly values the value, improves the value of proposition. It's really about one or the other is not enough, but getting all of them is really the idea in terms of the value proposition. So whenever I kind of lay this idea out, or Brian lays this idea out, First question we have is, well, is there really a there there? Is there enough hydrogen demand to kind of get there? So this is where I'm going to be able to start showing you some of the analysis results that we've, that we've developed over the last four or five months. We really have just started on this in January. Um, and so we started thinking about, well, what's the market potential for a lot of those bubbles that were on the right side of that chart that I showed? And we estimated, well, how big is that market? What does that look like? Remember today's hydrogen market, and it says down here, the US market is about 10 million metric tons per year. That was about 2% of our total energy use. Thinking about the technical potential, you could see, well, if the refineries and chemical processing industry don't change, technical potential is about 8 million metric tons per year. It kind of stays there. Metals, if we were to reshore the steel that we now import, in other words, produce it here in the US instead of importing the steel without changing any of the steel that we use in the US, or any of the steel we produce in the US today, there's about 5 million metric tons that could be produced from that. The ammonia industry right now uses about two to three million metric tons per year. With an increase in biofuels, we foresee that increasing to about five million metric tons per year. Hydrogen can be directly injected in the natural gas system. That's something I didn't touch on a couple slides ago. But the natural gas system in your appliances can handle up to about 10% on a volume basis hydrogen mixed in with the methane, a little bit of ethane, and the other chemicals that are in that natural gas. And that, if you were to directly inject it, we could use about 7 million metric tons per year. Obviously, if we do what I talked about earlier, taking the hydrogen, some carbon dioxide, making methane out of it, that number could be much, much higher. Biofuels could utilize up to about 4 million metric tons per year for the biofuel conversion to be able to reduce that oxygen from the biomass and, and produce liquid fuels, especially for air and marine. Light-duty vehicles, if we were to convert about 75% of our light-duty vehicles, that's about 190 million vehicles on the road, we would, have a, we would require about 28 million metric tons of hydrogen per year. And other transportation, buses, trucks, things like that, they could require about 3 million metric tons per year. So with that, we get to a technical potential of about 60 million metric tons per year, which is starting to say, okay, maybe there is actually something there that we should be thinking about in terms of this hydrogen potential that doesn't necessarily compete with a lot of the oxygen, or a lot of the electricity opportunities that we have. And this map here shows kind of where that potential is located. As you might expect, a lot of it's on the two coasts where there's a lot of population. A lot of it's here on the Gulf Coast where you've got both population and a lot of industry. And a lot of it's in what it's traditionally the Rust Belt where there's a lot of industry because of the, the, the pieces that we have here. There's a lot of that type of potential in those areas. So this is the technical potential. I haven't gotten into whether or not this economically makes any sense. I mean, especially think about injection of the natural gas system. You've got to have really cheap hydrogen to do that. But this just kind of gives us an idea of what the technical potential is. 60 million metric tons per year is not a small number to have to, to, to start worrying about. It's not going to be your biggest. It's not going to be the size of electricity. But it's not a small number at all. So the next question I get, and probably not in this audience, but in a lot of audiences, is, well, can we make that much hydrogen without using up all of our land space to, make, to put in solar panels or direct photoche photochemical uh, hydrogen producers? And so what we did is we looked at, well, what's the technical potential? Uh, my colleagues, and I'm sure you've seen these maps, you even see these maps sometimes in movies. I have the Wall Street, the updated Wall Street movie that came out about five years ago had one of these maps that showed NREL solar potential back in the background of one of the great scenes. We took some of that information, some of those maps, and we said, well, what is the technical potential? How much of the technical potential of solar and wind and biomass would we have to use to produce those 60 million metric tons per year? And as you can see, it's a really, really small sliver 
of the total P utility scale PV potential we have in the US. It's less than 1% that we require to produce hydrogen from our solar potential. That's not a lot of space. Likewise, wind, we'd be using up about 6% of the total potential wind resource in the United States to be able to produce this 60 million metric tons per year. Now, biomass, on the other hand, it would take about 75%, and about 25% of the biomass that we currently have in the U.S. is spoken for, I'll say. Spoken for, it's used for building products, it's used for pulp and paper, it's used for other types of materials like that. So we'd be pushing the edge of what's available in biomass. But that's if hydrogen came from, that 60 million metric tons I showed on the last slide came from solar, or from wind, or from biomass. If we think about it as a portfolio, it might come from a little bit from solar, a little bit from wind, a little bit from biomass. It kind of gives us an idea of where we are. Being under the, the current administration, we also had to think about, well, what about fossil and nuclear resources? Are they there? What's the impact there? So you can see here, natural gas, coal, and nuclear, some of the same information. The white bars are how much we use of each one of those today in today's energy sector, the way that today's energy system works. And the blue bars are how much additional use would be required to be able to produce that 60 million metric tons per year from each one of those individually. So you can see we've got natural gas, you've got to add about, uh, what is that, about 20% uh, to, the, to the natural gas, or about 30% to the natural gas. Coal, we've got to add about 80%. Nuclear, we've got to add a little bit. You've got to add almost double or almost triple the nuclear use to be able to do it. But are there resources for it? Well, if you look at the, uh, the total reserves, both proven and unproven, even if we were to use the 36 and a half quads of natural gas per year, we've got about 70 years worth of resources there. Likewise, coal, we've got lots and lots of coal. And nuclear, we've got a lot of nuclear. So there are domestic resources that are even non-renewable in this space, although for obvious reasons, including pollution and carbon emissions and others, that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to use that. It's just that they're there and there are opportunities to think about. So the next question I always get is, well, okay, we heard that, there's, that you've got a big use. We've heard that, there's, uh, that, that you've got resources to be able to do it. What are the real impacts if you were to be able to produce that or be able to produce and use that 60 million metric tons that you talked about? So what we did was just a really rough estimate of just the utilization of that 60 million metric tons on greenhouse gases within the U.S. from the energy sector, petroleum reduction, petroleum use in the U.S., and natural gas use in the U.S. And if we were to just use hydrogen to replace those 60 million metric tons we, show, we had, you can see we can reduce the greenhouse gases by 16%, petroleum by 17 and natural gas by about 14% within the US. That doesn't include all the secondary benefits that I mentioned. So this is just replacing hydrogen in refineries that's produced by natural gas with hydrogen that's produced via, uh, say, solar production of hydrogen via electrolysis and so forth down the list. If we were to be able to enable increased penetrations of solar and wind and other types of renewable technologies, there's probably higher reductions that are possible. And so on this slide, it gets into, well, what might that potential be? So here, again, we've got a Sankey diagram. We've got these energy producers on the left. We've got the users on the right. What we did is we started out with a kind of projected energy use in 2050 and we looked at, well, what happens if we were to be able to add hydrogen production to that just from electricity? And you can see how you might pull electricity out of there. Oh, I didn't include the slide that shows, well, if we were to use wind and solar instead, we would suddenly reduce our, our carbon emissions by, instead of by 20%, as you see in this slide, we would be able to reduce them by about 50%. Uh, which would really start to build up and start to be able to provide some sort of serious impact on our carbon emissions today. If we are to achieve anything that's much higher, we definitely would need to get to storage. We'd have to, have to think about how do we utilize hydrogen in better ways. So the next question is, okay, we've heard about is, is there a use for it? Is there generation capabilities? And what are the impacts? If you agree that, there's, that the, all three of those are impactful, then you start saying, well, can this ever economically make sense? What's the real challenge with this making sense? Today's steam methane reforming technology is what we use to be able to produce that 10 million metric tons per year that we have. We use natural gas, we run it through steam methane reforming. Uh, the natural gas is the carbon's released, the hydrogen is released as hydrogen itself. Some of the water that's injected or the steam that's injected, hydrogen's recovered from that and carbon goes out as carbon dioxide. 
that costs about $1.95 per kilogram um, if you uh, include all the capital expense, which is in the blue on the bottom, all the operating expense, and then the cost of the natural gas itself. And in fact, this, this calculation was done before some of the reduced gas prices, uh, natural gas prices that exist today at $3 per million BTUs or just under that, which is the price to, on the spot market today, uh, that actually is more like $1.50 per kilogram. But this gets you a kind of an idea of where we are. Electrolysis on the other end over here is, is about $4.20 today. And that $4.20 per kilogram is primarily electricity costs, as you can see by the big, big green bar up there, with a little bit for in the blue for the, to be able to pay for the capital and about $0.20 cents for, the fee, for the fixed operating costs. And so because of that, the, hydrogen, the DOE hydrogen program is always focused on, well, how do we increase our efficiency to the highest possible number, to this 66%, drive that up to the highest possible number that we can get to even if it costs us more in capital to be able to get there. That's always been the focus. But that's been focused on running, in it, running the electrolyzer 97% of the hours out of the year, or about 8,400 hours out of the year or so. If we think about this electrolyzer very differently, like, well, let's run it when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing and the loads are not that high, so we've got some extra electricity on the grid, maybe we've got some real opportunities here. So in these bars, what we've done is we've thought about, well, what might that happen? We've done this kind of thought experience of what might happen. So we said, well, let's say there's 40% of the time out of the year, you can get electricity that's really, really cheap. Instead of being six and a half cents per kilowatt hours, you might pay it in an in industrial uh, market. Let's pay two cents or one cent per kilowatt hour, but accept that we're only going to get electricity when there's too much electricity on the grid because the sun's shining, the wind's blowing, and the load is low, and that that's only that small number, so about 3,500 hours out of the year. If we do that, and we use today's electrolyzers, you can see it brings down the total cost of hydrogen production because we're paying a lot less for electricity. Now, the capital cost is still the same, and the lifetime is still the same, so the amount that you have to receive back, because you're only producing 40% or so as much hydrogen, you need to receive back the same amount to be able to cover the capital, the initial capital expense. And so that's about two and a half times higher than this here because the ratio of 97% to 40% is approximately two and a half. So you can see that that increased capital expense is there. Well, that's interesting. It's starting to get us in the ballpark if we can get two cent or one cent per kilowatt hour hydrogen. What happens if we actually do some R&D that changes this? Sorry, SMR stands for steam methane reforming, which is how we produce hydrogen today from natural gas. So that's the competition over here from natural gas. And over here is, well, what if we do with, from electricity? And as I showed here, if we just rethink our electrolyzer and we use it, we use our electrolyzers when the sun is shining, the wind is blowing, and the load is low, we could bring down our cost of hydrogen and make it somewhat competitive with SMR, although not quite there yet. But what happens, being a research laboratory, we always have to ask the question, what happens if we do some research and we can bring down that cost of our electrolyzer from $400 a kilowatt to $100 per kilowatt, or bring down that cost by 75%. And if we were to do that, you could suddenly see that our hydrogen price, our required, our, our levelized cost of hydrogen that we'd have to sell it for, is down around $1.70 to $1.15 or so. And we're starting to get to a point where it really is competitive against the competing technology of SMR. So are we optimistic that we can get down to do a 75% cost reduction uh, with the electrolyzer? Well, we really haven't spent, the hydrogen program really hasn't spent much R&D dollars in that space, but the hydrogen program has spent a lot of money on fuel cells. So this little figure on the upper right-hand corner shows what the benefits have been in terms of spending money on fuel cell uh, cost reduction over the last 15 years, from 2002 to now. And over that time, the fuel cell cost has, or the fuel cell art cost has decreased by about 80% because of the R&D done by Department of Energy funding, by GM funding, by Toyota funding, by others who are funding that fuel cell. Fuel cells and hydrogen are very, or fuel cells and electrolyzers are very similar in that electrolyzers take electricity, you've got a membrane and you separate water into hydrogen and oxygen. Fuel cells take hydrogen and oxygen, 
just you combine them across a membrane, you produce electricity and you utilize that electricity. They're essentially one another run in reverse. Now there's some nuances, there's different materials for the membranes, the catalysts aren't exactly run the same, gas diffusion layers aren't the same, but for the use for usefulness in this case, we can start to think about them as maybe that potential reduction of 80% could actually happen if we think long and hard about how to do that. And so that gives us confidence that we might be able to do achieve some of these targets that we're showing here. So with that, we kind of have answered the, the fourth question, which is, you know, are the economics there to actually produce hydrogen in this way compared to how we produce hydrogen today? And the real question then is, okay, well, that's the technical potential. That's what's absolutely possible without thinking about economics. The next question is, well, what's the economic potential? What markets would you compete in? How would you compete in those markets? What, what's happening there? And unfortunately, that's the work that we're doing right at this very moment. And so if I were to come back in six months, I'd be able to show you some results from that. But right now, what we're doing, Argonne National Lab is really looking at, well, what are the bottom-up demand estimates for each one of those markets? Where does, what price does hydrogen need to be at to be able to compete in each one of those markets? And at NREL, we're looking at, well, what's the hydrogen production cost from a couple technologies? Let's look at steam methane reforming as the incumbent technology. Let's look at high temperature electrolysis from nuclear generation, where we make the electrolysis unit more efficient by adding heat as well as electricity so that water splitting happens with less electricity required. And then this otherwise curtailed electricity, which in my mind is really the crux of this, taking the electricity that would otherwise be curtailed because of wind and solar and generate hydrogen from it and then do that feedback loop and identify whether we would produce more wind or whether we'd build more wind and solar in an economically efficient way. And the answer to that is yes, if we were to pay, and, and our preliminary estimates show that if we were willing to pay somewhere around $25 per megawatt hour or two and a half cents per kilowatt hour for that hydrogen at the bus where it's being produced, we would then be able to produce 60 million metric tons of, of hydrogen from wind and solar technologies based on a market model that would build up over that time. So again, efficient economics, those types of questions that are in that. So that's our preliminary results, is that we're very positive on that side. And then once we've got price requirements and the demand curves, we've got production cost estimates, what we're going to do is we're going to try to look at the economic potential and identify, well, which markets would we serve hydrogen to, which ones wouldn't we, what might happen in those spaces, and uh, how much hydrogen would we use? So that's really kind of the questions that we're trying to answer today. And by September, we're going to start having a lot of those answers that we can then share. And once we have those answers, then we're going to really think about, well, what are the benefits? So greenhouse gases are a big benefit. That's an easy one to think about. Reduction in petroleum use is an easy one to think about. But the ones that we're really starting to think about more, the ones that we're thinking about in different ways, are these other ones in terms of benefits like gas or like uh, pollutants within the atmosphere, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, particulates, uh, and greenhouse gas emissions, as well as water use, and what are those? And what we're doing is we're building off of what I think is a really nice piece of work by some colleagues of mine that's, looking, that's looked at renewable portfolio standards and what those costs and benefits are. And once you add up all of those and you start looking at savings in natural gas, you start, adding, uh, you start adding jobs in, we start to see what might be a really interesting argument in today's environment. So here, if they just have today's existing RPS compared to the total cost, what they did was they estimated those benefits on a dollar, cent per kilowatt hour of renewable energy. They just take the electricity system cost with today's RPS, they're looking at essentially a net zero. Why, would not, why wouldn't every state have a 30% RPS if we're at a net zero for it? Well, the problem is that the costs that we're offsetting are in many cases savings due to health savings. So it's medical insurance, the fact that fewer people have asthma, fewer people have breathing issues, fewer people have some of these other, some of these other health problems that are caused that are then offset by a slightly higher electricity costs coming from the renewables. Once we add those in, you start to get to some positive benefits. And then once you start adding greenhouse gases, depending upon your social cost of carbon you use, you start getting to some greater estimates. And likewise, you can see that if you look at a very high renewable electricity penetration in those green bars on the right, we're starting to get even higher benefits than that. So we're starting to think about and starting to talk about, hey, let's not just talk about greenhouse gas emissions, but let's take a step back and talk about air, talk about water, talk about some of the more traditionally uh, regulated type 
uh, type value streams that we have and think about what those values are and what the benefits of those might be. And so we're going to be balancing that out as we move forward in this h 2 at scale value proposition. So that's really kind of where we're going. That's why we want to do it. That's what the analysis is around. It's what a lot of the work is around why we want to get there. The last couple of slides I want to show you is around the necessary research and development that, we have, that we've proposed. Um, obviously, the low temperature uh, electrolysis, uh, based on that slide with the stacked bars that kind of went down as you went from left to right, the stacked bars is uh, one of the key R&D areas within this. However, as I mentioned, and I don't have a good slide on, high temperature electrolysis, it can be much, much more efficient, but it requires quite a, or it requires a significant amount of heat in addition to that electricity. In fact, with high temperature electrolysis, you can get more energy available in the hydrogen out than you put in in electricity in, because the additional energy that's put into it is put in in the form of heat. Now, if you're starting with heat, like if you've got a nuclear reactor, you're starting with heat, you suddenly don't have to go through that conversion to be able to make power from that heat at about 30% efficiency to utilize that power. You can just utilize that heat directly. So there's a lot of opportunities for high temperature electrolysis, including those with currently existing equipment. Likewise, on the utilization side, uh, hydrogen's an energy carrier. I talked a little bit about some of the opportunities that are out there. I actually get to speak, to mon uh, speak on Monday to a green chemistry group over at School of Mines about this very same topic. And one of the things I want to challenge them is, well, what else would you do? If you had really cheap, clean hydrogen, what else would you do with that hydrogen? How would you change, say, maybe our silica production in the U.S. today? How would you change maybe the way we think about concrete instead of, using, instead of using lime? Would you think about that differently? What might happen in different ways if you had this resource available at your fingertips? I think there's lots of opportunities, lots of research space out there, lots of really neat things that we can do to improve our energy system if we were to be able to think about the world in a slightly different way. And then, of course, if we've got hydrogen that can be generated, hydrogen that can be used, we've got to figure out better ways to move it and to distribute it. A lot of that is really around codes and standards, around safety, um, and, and those types of issues. Um, probably not necessary, again, for this group, but uh, it's, it's interesting if you look at some of these safety-type issues around fuel cell vehicles. Today, fuel cell vehicles, uh, can, you can lease. If you're in California, you can lease a fuel cell vehicle. There's one fuel cell vehicle here in Colorado today. I don't see Andrew out there. So he's the leaser of that fuel cell vehicle. Um, but there's fuel cell vehicles that you can fill up with hydrogen today. People have always been worried. You know, we always talked about fuel cell vehicles. People have been worried about the Hindenburg, some of those types of issues. The Hindenburg was obviously the flame was not a hydrogen flame because hydrogen dissipates much more rapidly than that flame actually. Uh, that flame actually was. It was really the, the the fabric, the cellulosic material around it, that was burning. But what's really interesting is some of the videos on today's storage units, these high pressure storage units. They've, they've done things like you take a high-powered rifle, you shoot it at the hydrogen storage unit, and you prove that it didn't pop or you didn't burst in, in a certain way and release hydrogen in that way. And if you're safe from a rifle shot, you're probably safe from most, most auto wrecks, things like that. So there's a lot of work that's been done in that automotive space. However, there's still a lot of work in terms of how do we store and distribute the same way we do natural gas today, which is in underground caverns all around us in places that we don't want to think about, like South Table Mountain, used to be up in Leiden, places like that. So those are the R&D areas that we have going on right now. Likewise, we've got these cross-cutting areas analysis, which I've talked a lot about, some of the analysis we're doing. Foundational sciences, which gets into these fundamental uses, as well as fundamental generators, membrane, membrane technologies, all those kinds of things. And then all the interactions with the electrical grid and what might the cost drivers have to be to be able to achieve, receive some of the value out of the grid. We could talk more about that in the, in the Q&A session if you're interested. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is a huge national laboratory team. I just want to acknowledge you know, the hundred or so people that have worked on this over the course of the last year and a half from a lot of, a lot of our sister labs around the country. It's been, it's been a great group to work with. Um, and then we've also worked with a lot of stakeholders around the U.S. We've held several workshops. We've had stakeholders ranging from the nuclear industry to renewables industries 
to grid folks, to electrolysis folks, to auto industry folks, uh, industrial gas folks telling us why we won't be able to compete with natural gas ever, uh, to metals and steel uh, R&D and metals and steel industry looking at ways to improve those systems as a whole, as well as a little bit with regulators and investors and, and, and others in that space. So I'll close out with, a, with what I think are kind of a couple of fun pictures, although not quite the picture I was looking for when I first put this slide together. Talked a lot about air pollution, about greenhouse gases, about some of, the, some of the motivation behind it. You can see the picture on the left was in 1999, Warren Gretz, who was the NREL photographer at that point in time, took a picture from, this is Colfax up near where the First Bank building is, uh, just west of Sims of downtown Denver, you could see some of the issues with air quality there. I was really looking for a picture from what I remember being a child in Denver in about 1976, 1977, and some of the brown clouds that we had in the late 70s and 1980 or so, uh, primarily due to, to nitrogen pollution within the air at that point in time. And there were days where I can, I'm convinced that I could stand at the base of one of these downtown skyscrapers and couldn't see the top of it. Um, now, pretty much every day, you can, see, uh, you can see downtown Denver, even from the NREL site, that picture on the right, Brian Pivovar took, for, took uh, of the NREL site, or took from the NREL site of downtown Denver last, uh, right before last, New Year's last year. Um, you could see there that even when you could see downtown, we still get a pretty significant brown cloud. Now, most of that one is caused by particulates from combustion and particulates from uh, re wheels on the road and wear and tear and things like that. Uh, but there's, a, there's still a lot out there. So in my opinion, we've done a lot over the last, at least over my lifetime, over the last 40 plus years to be able to reduce pollution, to be able to improve our energy system, to be able to improve the quality of our lives. However, as I look at that picture on the right, I see for my children's sake, there's a lot more that we need to do. And so there's a challenge to all of us to try to find ways to be able to do that as we move forward. With that, I'd like to close the presentation, or at least the, the formal part of the presentation, and open it up to questions. And anybody who might have any thoughts, comments, questions on what I said. I might have missed this in your presentation, but can you, first off, two questions. Can you give us some detail into the chemical processes that are involved in the bioconversion mm -hmm. uh, into energy? And second, this may sound like a really dumb question, is there a good and semi-clean way to convert coal into hydrogen? Mm -hmm. no, no, two good questions. Um, let me start with the, the biomass one. So the biomass conversion that I'm thinking of is a fast pyrolysis of biomass. So essentially, the biomass, you grind it down to a point where it's essentially a powder or a sawdust. It's then run over a, uh, it's run with a catalyst at a relatively low temperature in the, with in the in the lack of presence of oxygen, so without any oxygen present, and it comes out as kind of this oily type mixture. However, as I mentioned in it, that oily type mixture is made up of lots of long organic chemicals with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in them. They don't burn very well in vehicles or air travel or, or even for marine. Although they will burn in some, especially older diesel engines. They, won't, they don't burn very well in today's types of engines. So use of hydrogen helps to remove that oxygen, giving us more of a carbon and hydrogen mixture. So we're looking at long olefins that have like 10 carbon atoms and uh, 22 hydrogen atoms on them, things like that, that, that can then burn. Um, so that's kind of the thought process there. There's some other opportunities you can gasify, which is very similar to the pyrolysis process, but is in the presence of a little bit of air. You can gasify there, end up with a syngas, which is carbon monoxide and hydrogen, add some more hydrogen to it, be able to get some chemicals like carbon dioxide to hydrogen, some of those types of technologies. So that's kind of at a very high level, and we could go into a lot of detail. I could spend hours going into detail, but we won't do that tonight, into how to convert biomass into fuels in this way. The second question about coal is a really good one. Um, that's similar to biomass in that the way that we think about converting coal to hydrogen today is it's a partial combustion in the presence of some oxygen and you end up with, again, a syngas, like I mentioned with the biomass. You end up with that coal, you end up with carbon monoxide from the coal, so that the carbon items in the, in the, in the, uh, in the coal mixes in, you produce a little bit of carbon monoxide, um, and then you add, some, you add some water to it, you get some hydrogen out, and you start producing carbon monoxide and hydrogen, then you can go to carbon, 
carbon dioxide and hydrogen by adding some more water to it, and you get this hydrogen stream, but you get a lot of carbon dioxide out of it. The negative is obviously you've produced a lot of, of carbon dioxide. The positive is that you've produced it in one place. And if, you're, if carbon capture and sequestration is ever going to work, it's going to have to work from where you're producing carbon dioxide in one place. If you're producing carbon dioxide out of every tailpipe out there, you'll never be able to sequester that because you'll never be able to ca collect that carbon dioxide. However, you produce it in one place, then you have that opportunity at least. Sequestration is still one of those questions that some people are convinced. I was, I was in a meeting about two years ago, and I had a guy yelling and cursing at me because sequestration was going to happen, and my bit of dubiousness about it, uh, he was not happy about it. So, I was uh, wondering how uh, you can envision combining all these technologies and getting them balanced. I mean, maybe we're just not there yet, but does it take a, I mean, with the capitalist system right now, the price of something goes up, and something uh, adjusts something, mm -hmm. uh, it, it sort of naturally balances itself except when rogue capitalism or, or uh, major disasters, but I mean, it, it is something that sort of uh, mm -hmm. has managed to balance itself. Mm -hmm. Do you have to have a, a strong central authority or how, how do you tie all these mm -hmm. systems together? If maybe we're not there yet, I'm just... Right, so, so my belief is that well-maintained and well-operated markets that include what we often have as externalities should be able to get us there. So the grid uh, here in Colorado, we don't have uh, kind of the, a grid market that's set up for the transmission market, but many parts of the country do, uh, especially in the eastern part of the country. So PJM runs from, runs from Pennsylvania west to essentially Illinois. Um, New England ISO covers the New England area and others, and they've developed markets to be able to manage the grid. And every, and, and the way those markets run is that they bid in at times in terms of what they promise to generate the next day, 24 hours, or they also in many cases have a four-hour market to be able to update that 24-hour bid, and then they get some real-time management of it. And the central authority is just the market management. I almost think about it like I think about, say, the New York Stock Exchange that manages all these transactions, chooses which ones. In that case, they've got to do a little bit more in terms of choosing which ones win because you've got a lot of spatial issues and other issues you don't have in, say, a stock exchange. But chooses which one wins and then is able to manage it. When I think about hydrogen using hydrogen from electrolysis, while the hydrogen users will bid in, hey, we'll, we'll pay 1.2 cents a kilowatt hour to buy electricity during this hour time period to be able to take it off your hands, or we'll pay 1.1 cent per kilowatt hour, and that's a, kind of the opposite side of bid. But I see it just as an evolution of this same market. Now, there's still a lot evolving in power markets, capacity markets don't work today. There's all kinds of other issues we're still trying to figure out, but I've got confidence that over time and with our ability with, uh, to be able to do transactions very fast in ways that a generation ago we could never have imagined, even probably 15 years ago I couldn't have even imagined, we're starting to get to that point where, where we might be able to do so. The new development that I've uh, recently heard about um, uh, it's basically an IT system called blockchain mm -hmm. that um, is hotly in development. And uh, since all of this energy production also mm -hmm. needs to be in a marketplace and being paid for uh, in tiny increments and huge increments, this blockchain system um, may um, pose a platform on which to trade all these um, produced and consumed energy units mm -hmm. uh, effectively. Um, because uh, what you left out earlier in your answer to the uh, uh, coal conversion is obviously the economic argument. Mm -hmm. uh, is it feasible? Uh, I mean, can you even handle the transactions? And mm -hmm. then uh, is the outcome such that anybody would be interested? Right. No, so, so to comment on blockchain, I think blockchain is a really, really interesting opportunity. I, I think that for the very large markets, and we're talking about megawatts of power that, were, that, were, that are being exchanged over the course of hours of time, I don't think blockchain is, absolutely, is, is going to be essential there because it's big enough pieces, big enough markets. But one of my other projects is we're starting to think about, well, what happens if you've got a smart inverter on your house that's providing reactive power to your distribution feeder? How do you deal with these, these transactions that are going to have a value of half a cent, a quarter of a cent per transaction, but might add up to $10 over the course of a month? Blockchain has some great opportunities to be able to support that, both in terms of 
managing the transa managing the, the monetary aspect of the transaction, but also in terms of managing whether or not you actually provided the service that you promised to provide during the transaction. I think there's really cool opportunities in there. A ways off, but really cool opportunities. So it's really exciting. And it would address the rooftop solar market. While I, uh, I, as I, if I understand correctly, you were totally focused on utility scale with your presentation yeah. tonight. Yeah. So this presentation, we focus only on utility yeah. scale, with the exception of you know power balancing or energy balancing. Yeah. I was going to ask a question. Uh, you talk about electrolysis to produce a hydrogen. Mm -hmm. How does that? Can you envision something where you're trying to get a, a purification of water for su water supply as part of this, as well as production of the hydrogen? And if that's the case, how sensitive is this whole process to the quality of the water to begin with the mm -hmm. feedstock? Mm -hmm. Can it be junk, you know, not junk water, but no. mud water or sewage water or whatever? Right. right. So that's a, that's, a, that's a really important R&D question. Uh, for a, a really important R&D question for electrolysis development. Today, you're right, today's electrolyzers require very, very pure water, and, and there's water management types of issues there. Uh, future electrolyzers, we may be able to improve the membranes to be able to manage that. We may be able to take a hit in terms of like, the efficiencies and some of those things to be able to deal with a little bit of dirtier water. Um, but as we think about this problem, that's one of the ways that we'll have to start thinking through and both in terms of R&D from the electrolyzer itself and then the system as, as a whole as well, because you could use some of that energy to then purify water. I mean, you get to very pure water if you're willing to invest enough energy into it, right? I mean, so it's, it's that trade-off of how, how do you best invest the energy. And just to note, the 66% efficiency was based on essentially tap water purity. So water quality much worse water quality places at taps than here, but still drinking quality is where they started. Uh, this, this question is uh, being asked on behalf of uh, Bob Evans, who I think you work with. Yeah, I used to work with Bob, yeah. I talked to him today, tried to get him here. He had a conflict. Uh, he and I have both been working on a technology called biochar, mm -hmm. in which I think uh, hydrogen could be a, either considered a co-product or a Mm -hmm. or a byproduct, yeah. and um, so, so, so <laughs> it, it would be basically slow pyrolysis, which you, yep. you've mentioned a little bit here, but the, um, the technical issue, I think, is that you want, in, in the biochar process, to get rid of the hydrogen, yep. and that the hydrogen, I think, would be most valuable in the forms that you're using it as opposed to the usual combustion of the hydrogen. So my question is, Is it has that been considered and is carbon monoxide, is it relatively easy to separate carbon monoxide and hydrogen? So on the, on the first question, has, has biochar been considered? No, to date we have not considered biochar. I'll have to think about that and, and how we might want to consider that within this process because you're absolutely right, there's a, there's a, a substantial amount of energy in conversion from biomass to the to the coke product that comes out of biochar ultimately and there's hydrogen in there so there could be some really interesting opportunities in that space I haven't thought through that so that's that's a really good point um, yeah pass that on to Bob and tell him to call me so <laughs> I haven't talked to him in ages so it'd be really good to talk to him um, second uh, the second part in terms of carbon monoxide versus hydrogen um, there are definitely separation technologies that are out there. Off the top of my head, you said carbon monoxide to hydrogen, right? Yeah, so carbon monoxide to hydrogen, there are definitely separation technologies that are out there. I don't know them well enough off the top of my head to be able to say how cost effective, what the costs, in either in terms of energy or monetary costs, those are. Um, but again, something that would be interesting to think about in terms of how we utilize the process. Normally what we do, when we've got a stream that's carbon monoxide and hydrogen, you do a kind of another water gas shift reaction where steam or water is put in. The oxygen from the water is taken by the carbon monoxide, you make carbon dioxide, leaving the hydrogen which forms the hydrogen molecule, and then you get carbon dioxide and hydrogen which is a well-known 
uh, a well-known separation part of steam methane reforming. So that's a well-known separation. That's normally what's done. And maybe what's most effective, unless there's a value of that carbon monoxide as a product. Well, yeah, well, as a product somewhere, whether it's for combustion or for, for chemical processing or something else, that they, we'd have to figure out what, what that value is versus the cost. That's an interesting idea. So you mentioned oh. um, having these centralized facilities for effective carbon sequestration. Yes. I've talked with Tri-State Transmission, a utility company, and they've mentioned any generation or energy storage to be done at a smaller distribution company level. Hmm. And I was just curious uh, what size and what's the economic feasibility of these facilities that you're proposing? Oh, so um, if it wasn't clear from my tone of voice, I, I'm not exactly, I'm not a big believer that carbon sequestration has economic feasibility in any way, shape, or form with today's technology. Um, that's where I come from. Like I said, I got yelled at a year ago or a year and a half ago by a guy uh, who works at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab who is absolutely positive that they're economically feasible. And I would say his argument is that if you've got, I say, a 100 megawatt coal plant or larger, so that's not a very large coal plant at 100 megawatts. Um, often coal plants are at uh, you know, 500 megawatts. Uh, the Navajo station down in northeast Arizona is two gigawatts. Um, there, they think that as long as the sequestration resource is nearby, that they, c that they can do it. Now, what does nearby mean? I don't know exactly how many, is that a couple hundred miles or so? Probably about that. And usually what they talk about for sequestration there is saline aquifers. So we've got highly salinated water underground, just like we've got water that's relatively clean underground, even deeper in many cases, we've got highly salinated water that's under a lot of pressure because of its depth underground. And the thought there is you can inject carbon dioxide into that water, it would then be, it would then dissolve into that water and be able to stay there without adding any additional pressure. Um, again, our DOE's been doing work on this for 20 years. Uh, it's not my area of expertise, so I shouldn't comment on it too, too strongly, but I haven't seen enough results to say that I trust it, uh, even at that 100, 500 megawatts, gigawatt, two gigawatt type scale. So hope that helps a little bit. Um, we could look some more to try to get some more details on what, what, the, what the advocates believe. Well, so that's a different problem. The Oklahoma problem is, is another, in my mind, a really, really interesting problem because it, they actually produce water when they, when they get natural gas out of the ground and then they're just injecting it back in. And Oklahoma has that, and some of you who might have lived in Denver in the 50s might remember some of the, some of the, earth, some of the earth tremors that we had back, back then, it's before my time, so it wasn't we, but that you guys had before my time due to the injections at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And that was very easily traced back to those injections. It's the exact same problem. But they think if you go deep enough, you're going to get away from that. We'll, I don't know. We'll see if we ever try that. It's, it's kind of a high-risk activity in some parts of the country, I would L say. A little clarifi clarification here. Uh, I, I'm opposed to the type of sequestration I think you're describing. Yep. Biochar is considered sequestration. You're absolutely right. There's a whole different type of sequestration which, where it's not a carbon dioxide sequestration. It's a carbon, molecular, essentially mo molecular carbon or carbon char type but sequestration. you're happy enough. You're that. absolutely right. No, you're, you're absolutely right. That's a whole different different problem than the carbon dioxide sequestration and a different opportunity. Yeah. Oh, uh, sure. This isn't really a follow-up, but mainly like a different topic. Sure. I'm aware of research at the Colorado School of Mines of using fuel cells and electrolysis for liquid ammonia, which is relatively hydrogen-dense mm -hmm. chemical. Mm -hmm. Except I, I may not have been paying attention, but I didn't hear any mention of fuel cells application in hydrogen-based economy. So I focused on fuel cells for transportation uh, primarily, so fuel cell electric vehicles. I mentioned that. I did not get into alternative ammonia production as opposed to the Haber-Bosch process, which is how we produce ammonia today. Um, but yeah, there's, there's long been some really interesting research in how do you utilize, uh, how, do you, how do you utilize fuel cells with some hydrogen input um, to be able to do that. There's also some, so to be able to produce ammonia um, again, I can't speak to how that compares today to the Haber-Bosch process or what's happening. What I can speak to is the Haber-Bosch process, how we produce ammonia today, 
is very, very heat integrated. In other words, when I talk to, say, somebody from Air Liquide, and I just had this comment a couple weeks ago, it's for somebody from Air Liquide, he said, we really want to be able to sell hydrogen to the ammonia producers, but we've learned that they're really hydrogen producers with an ammonia back end, and that all their value proposition is in ammonia, is, is in hydrogen production, even though they're selling ammonia as a product. So it's an interesting situation. It's an interesting market. I think that's going to be a really challenging one to get into, although there's some opportunities. I also didn't comment. I mentioned methanation at one point in time where you could take hydrogen and carbon dioxide. There's also a co-electrolysis method where you could take hydrogen and carbon dioxide using co-electrolysis to produce methane coming out. And that that methane might be a lot of use, might be injected. Another really cool technology that's on the end. I, as I mentioned, I think there's a lot of potential out there for inorganic and organic technologies that I haven't really thought about because we've never thought about hydrogen as a feed or in this type of way. We've always thought about we well, need natural gas to get to hydrogen. 